motivated breach of law to contribute to changing the law or to express one's, um, one's dissatisfaction with the law. Um, and civil disobedience is by no means a new topic. Um, so, so, you know, I, I'm not saying something uh, in this paper that's necessarily uh, groundbreaking. However, in my research, I found that civil disobedience is often a phrase that is used to characterize behavior in a very loose fashion. Um, and so my perspective on this issue is to analyze the, the theory of civil disobedience, um, but more importantly, to critique it. And to critique it in a South African context, namely one of South Africa being a constitutional democracy. And I think this weekend, um, we've had a lot of discussion about you know, whether we really are a constitutional democracy, and if we are, whether that is in fact a positive or a negative thing. Um, but I'm gonna take it on face value that we are a constitutional democracy and proceed from that basis. Okay, so there's, there's, many, there's many authors who have written on civil disobedience, but very few from South Africa. Um, in South African writings that, that I've drawn on, the focus tends to be on the anti-apartheid movement, and, and this raises a lot of um, controversy in in the theory of civil disobedience, because there's a there's a, a disagreement about whether the anti-apartheid movement was in fact civil disobedience or whether it was revolutionary conduct that is something different from civil disobedience. Because at its root, civil disobedience proponents argue that there is always a fidelity to the law, and under apartheid a strong argument could be made that in fact there wasn't that fidelity, that there was a desire to change the entire legal system and structure of our society, and so therefore that can't be civil disobedience. My view is that it's not quite as simple as that, that even in moments where there was clear revolutionary um, desires, there were also um, there was also to some extent a respect of the legal system. And, and for those of you who were at the opening panel, um, you'll remember me saying that even, even where people fundamentally disagreed and disputed the legitimacy of the apartheid state, there were still uh, many, uh, many actions that were taken seemingly in compliance with the law, uh, whether that was getting married in court or registering births, getting driver's licenses, applying for student loans and home loans, um, and whether that was because of pragmatism or some fidelity to the law, um, I think is an interesting uh, conversation to have in and of itself. Writings in South Africa tend to focus on <coughs> the anti-apartheid movement and then also on protest action, and particularly service delivery protests um, now, I'm interested in this link between what civil disobedience ostensibly is in theory and what it may actually be or should be in South Africa today. And my interest on this topic definitely is inspired by the student movements of 2015 and 2016, particularly the students largely at UCT that I've had the privilege of engaging with. And I was, I was struck by the, by the discourse by academics and by the public um, that while the issues raised by the students were legitimate and important, there were other ways of taking it forward. And these other ways, so I'm told, are what we lawyers refer to as due process. Now, due process, by its literal meaning, assumes that there is firstly a process and that it is due, i.e. that people are able to access it. Now, from my observations, I think of the world in general, um, despite our constitutional structures, there is a lack of accessible, effective processes available to vulnerable people. Specifically in the context of post-apartheid South Africa, where the socio-economic consequences of colonialism and apartheid are most acutely still lived, what processes are available to challenge poverty, discrimination, injustice, lack of education, hunger, sanitation, 
you know, all the really big issues. It seemed a lame response to me, therefore, to tell students that, well, you're able to run for election on the SRC or contact the harassment office at the university or the university ombudsman. Effectively, we were telling students to be patient, more patient. And as we learned in the Grootboom case, which was a litigant who won her constitutional court case on the right of access to housing, life itself is running out for many people before their patients. Because unfortunately, Mrs. Grootboom died, despite having won a constitutional case, before ever herself receiving a house. Now, the students are saying no more patients. And I'm inclined to think that they are justified in that. So where does that leave us? What are we as lawyers and academic lawyers to do about it? We can be sympathetic, but we are bound by the rule of law, right? No, not right. We can change the law. We can make it perform its function of serving the society within which it operates. Not part of society, not only some of the time. That must always be the goal however difficult to actually achieve it is. At its heart, everyone is equal before the law. A blind um, loyalty to the rule of law without interrogating the laws themselves and the structure of society is to do an injustice, not just to the law, but also to the people that are supposed to be served by the law. Now, this framework is important because Civil, disobe so, sorry. Civil disobedience has always been understood as a defense to unlawful conduct. So people who engage in civil disobedience are able to raise the fact that they are acting as civil disobedience as a defense to their unlawful conduct. Sometimes it's a legal defense, but it is always a moral defense. Now, at the moment, broader society and certainly in the small world of academia and the legal profession, we are not recognizing the moral defensiveness of the protests that we are seeing in our society today. So we need to reimagine the definition and the elements of civil disobedience. The generally accepted elements require conduct to be unlawful, public, nonviolent, non-coercive, and the protagonist of civil disobedience must be accepting of punishment. These are uh, drawn from, from various authors. Henry Thoreau, who was the first person to articulate civil disobedience as a theory, Rawls and Raz, who took it much further, and even more recently, uh, Kimberly Brownlee. Well, those elements alone tell us that it's that they simply don't fit with our South African context. Unlawfulness already raises questions. Is refusing to buy an e-tag unlawful? Is this a more middle-class example of civil disobedience? What about disrupting a university lecture? I'm still not convinced that this is unlawful. It's annoying. It's rude. But is it an offense? Um, and I think that, uh, that we haven't properly interrogated this issue, but we are dealing with disruption of university lectures as though they are crimes. Nonviolence. I don't even have the time to start doing this justice. No pun intended on justice. Um, but we clearly need to interrogate violence and what it is, acknowledging that it, is, that it is a contended concept, a very, very contended concept with many facets and manif manifestations. Interpersonal violence, threats of violence, structural violence, systemic violence. Um, it is obvious to us, or to most people, that um, when one student hits another student with a stick, that is clearly violence. Whether it's justified or anything else is a different story. But I think prima facie, we can say, yes, it's physical force, therefore it is violence. But if we look at a more complicated concept, what about a white male student spitting on a black female student? 
in a sense, on a prima facie view, that is somewhat less violent because there was no physical force, there was no injury. But what about the loss of dignity? What about what it represents when a white man disrespects a black woman in a context where that very relationship of power is at the heart of what is being contested? Um, if we don't see that as equal violence, if not worse, um, then, then we are really not understanding the concept of violence in its full complication. Non-coercive, I mean, wow, I don't even, yeah. I mean, do we really need to dispute that non-coercive should not be an element of civil disobedience? When Rawls developed this theory of civil disobedience, including non-coerciveness as being an element, it was for nearly just societies. Now, do we really expect South Africans who don't have food, jobs, security, sanitation, etc., to simply communicate their problems without demanding that something be done about it. Clearly, if we take that view, we think that we are living in a nearly just society. And I would say that then we are living on cloud cuckoo land. We need we need a theory that can actually speak to a South African context that takes into account generations of oppression, traditions of victimization, decades of inertia for socioeconomic reform, lack of lawful mechanisms for change, and I put lawful in quotation marks. And once we've done that, and when I say we, I mean this is what I want to do develop that theory that actually works in a South African context. So once we've done that, we need to think about what to do with it. Does, does that change our thinking about legality, about criminality, about sentencing? But that will have to be the subject of my next paper.